My name is Ram. Um, I'm the R&D manager at Millar. Um, I oversee the um, integration of MEMS pressure sensors into catheter-based applications. Um, the title of our talk today is Untold Challenges of Pressure Sensor Integration. Um, so we put together a series of slides that talk, talk about the different challenges someone can encounter when they start this, traveling this journey, going from choosing a sensor to integrating into the device, getting to the compliance and getting into production. So we hope this information is useful to you. And, uh, you know, uh, we'd like this to be a two-way street. We'd like to learn as much as uh, we have to offer. So without uh, further ado, let's uh, get started. Okay. So let's start with uh, what are some of the major pressure measurement applications that are, you know, at play right now. Um, so that forms the background of our talk today. So uh, we see a lot of activity in the heart assist device space where there's a number of circulatory assist devices that temporarily relieve the heart, um, unload the heart so it can recover. And, you know, these are typically in the two to three week um, application timeframe. And uh, historically, a lot of these devices have a motor with, an, with a pump and all these devices are working at a fixed speed. Um, you know, that's the first generation. Going forward, a lot, a lot of these companies are seeing the need to adjust therapy based on the physiological needs of the patient, right? And so that's where a pressure sensor comes in. Pressure sensor feedback enables that, allows more physiological modulation of pressure, um, diurnal changes. And then in the urology space, we're all familiar. Um, lithotripsy is a very common procedure of breaking up kidney stones and such. But there's a certain risk associated with that procedure, and that is, you know, when there's too much pressure, there can be backflow from the kidneys. Adding a pressure sensor to urological applications allows the physician to modulate the, the pressure applied so these risks don't happen. Um, heart failure space, today there's a, um, a lack of a method to evaluate cardiac contractility. Um, what's a better method to evaluate contract, cardiac contractility than to put a pressure sensor and look at the DPDT? Um, it's a great index of uh, control of uh, cardiac uh, heart failure and physicians have now can look at it and titrate their therapies and such. Um, yeah, again, evaluation of heart failure from a, today, heart failure is being evaluated from a variety of composite signals like, you know, fluid retention, weight gain, so on and so forth. Um, adding a pressure sensor to the pulmonary artery, um, you know, provides a direct evaluation of the left ventricular and diastolic pressure. PA pressure is a good surrogate for end diastolic pressure. And we see a lot of activity in this space, uh, you know, with CardioMEMS and a lot of other companies getting that space. Um, in neuro, um, you know, monitoring of intracranial pressure is, is very important for uh, traumatic injury. Like if someone has an accident, they go to the emergency room, the first thing the physicians want to measure, monitor is your brain pressure. Um, historically, your intracranial pressure has been measured using fluid fill lines, but now there's an industry trends toward, trend towards using sensors to, uh, tipped in catheters to measure the pressure locally. Um, you know, Millar has a 25 year presence in the space. We understand the application, the challenges. We are in volume manufacturing in the space. Okay, and we do an upwards of 70, 80,000 catheters a year. Um, other applications are related to device operation. Either we're trying to measure uh, the amount of fluid left in an in insulin pump or a pain medication device, or we're trying to look, uh, help the device stay in the right place, right? If it's a catheter-based device, um, the physician can deploy it during surgery, but then afterwards, during the entire period of use, is it going to stay there, right? That's where a pressure sensor comes in. By measuring the signals, you know it's in the right place, right? Okay, so let's take a step back. Um, we talked through a number of applications. So to summarize, um, a lot of the drivers for pressure sensor integration come from second generation devices. There's already a device out there that's serving clinical need. That's been out there for a number of years. And then now we're beginning to see, okay, how can I optimize this device? So it provides more, so it enables a more smarter system, enables more physiological feedback operation of the whole system and it uh, enables an optimized operation of the system. So that's the biggest driver that we see um, that it, that's pushing us, pushing more and more pressure sensor integration. And we, um, this trend is a continuing trend. We see this, a lot of opportunity in this space. 
And if you also notice, I walked through a number of applications and I'm by no means is that list comprehensive. I, I just wanted to share some things that are interesting. And so these applications are very diverse and each application is very unique, right? There's usually something that's pretty unique about an application, either the size or power or the duration of use and so on and so forth. And the process of product development using a pressure sensor requires careful navigation. You know, that's where expertise comes in. Okay, so we talked about some trends in the market, right? And where the pressure sensors are used. Now look at, uh, let's start going into what are the kind of applications, right? Broadly speaking, pressure sensing applications can be categorized into either a short-term application, which is less than 29 days, right? Most of the heart assist devices are within two to three weeks at most. Um, you know, uh, ICP, intracranial pressure is about a week to two weeks. So, and then there's the chronic space, which is here you're talking about devices, implantable medical devices that are constantly monitoring the pressure either in the heart or some part of the body and managing the therapy, right? These are the two basic categories of uh, clinical applications. And then when you talk talking pressure measurements, you're either talking about a gauge measurement or an absolute measurement. A gauge measurement is the term used for a measurement that is referenced to atmospheric pressure, okay? Um, these kind of measurements are simpler to do, but they can be afforded only by a certain application that can allow a wider catheter, right? The, the pressure is measured with respect to atmosphere and it uses a vent tube to vent the back of a sensor to the atmosphere. Um, but if it works for you, great. That's, you know, it's simpler and provides very reliable trending of pressure. Many applications cannot afford a wider lumen catheter, right? And so, if you're talking about implantable or if you're talking about uh, pressure sensing in tortuous vasculature, you are pushed to an absolute measurement. An absolute measurement um, measures pressure with respect to an internal vacuum. The sensor is measuring pressure with respect to an internal vacuum. And the system requires a barometric pressure reference, right? Um, any given day, the barometric pressure changes by five to six millimeters of mercury. And that's, you know, that kind of a change um, completely you know, derails the clinical signal that physicians and, you know, are expecting to see, right? When they administer a drug, they're expecting to see a downward trend or an upward trend or what have you, and a five to six millimeter change can derail that. So you do need a barometric sensor somewhere in the system that takes out that variation from atmospheric pressure changes. So uh, just as an example, uh, a sensor built into a system that's at sea level, at Houston, we are in sea level, it typically measures around 760 millimeters of mercury. And if it's moved to a hospital in Colorado, which is 5,000 feet above sea level, you're now talking about 630 millimeters of mercury. You know, just by moving the patient from one place to the other, you know, there's a range of 130 millimeters of mercury that you have to account for earlier, right? So we have to, you know, um, device developers have to factor this in early on into the system design, right? And this is going to play into a lot of the accuracy and, you know, um, and even translate to product cost at the end. We'll see how that happens. I briefly mentioned fluid fill pressure lines before. Uh, I wanted to introduce that to you. The fluid fill pressure lines are still in use in a variety of uh, traumatic and emergency care applications. It's been in use for over five decades. Um, industry is slowly beginning to transition away from this. Um, in a fluid pressure line, you typically have a, a sensor that's located outside the body. You know, it's either hanging off a pole or side by the um, bedside. And then you have this tube that runs all the way from the sensor to some kind of a catheter that's then inserted to the vasculature. And this tube is filled with saline. And uh, the pressure is communicated from inside the body through this fluid to the sensor. As you can see, the whole line you know, is a sensor, right? Um, it requires a lot of expertise to set these things up. They come as kits that are finally assembled at the point of use. And they suffer from a lot of challenges like resonance and damping. And, uh, but nevertheless, you know, this, was, this is a standard of care in many uh, critical care applications today. So, like I said, industry slowly transitioning from 
uh, fluid fill lines to localized pressure measurement. By localized pressure measurement, we mean measurement of pressure local to a certain area, like either the heart or some part of the brain or the airway, so ha what have you, right? And when you want to get into that space, right, what are my options in terms of sensors, right? Um, we have three major categories of sensors that are used today to measure pressure. The first being the piezo-resistive sensors. Piezo-resistive sensors are MEM sensors made from silicon. Um, they share the same technology as a number of uh, other industries like you know, automotive and industrial. There's a number of vendors who make these sensors. It's typically a, a Wheatstone's bridge or a half bridge. And if size is critical to your application, piezo-resistive is the way to go. Okay, piezo-resistive sensors are scaling like CMOS ICs are. They're continuing that trend. They're continuing to become smaller and smaller and the vendors are pushing it. And so going with this sensor allows you to ride that wave, right? And there's more number of vendors available in piezo-resistive than other uh, sensor categories. So you have a good selection. And then a lot of the technological improvements in the automotive and industrial space kind of come over to the medical space as well. These sensors are slightly higher power, but if your catheter-based application power is not typically your concern, or if you're implantable still, you can do duty cycling or some kind of techniques to mitigate power concerns. Capacitive is the next option. Capacitive sensors are lower power, okay? They're well suited for implantable, but capacitive comes with its own trade-offs, right? Um, they have to be packaged really closely to the IC and that's processing the signal. Um, there's parasitics from the sensor, and these sensors don't scale really well. They, you know, they're typically much larger than piezo resistive sensors, but they do offer lower power operation. And I forgot to mention, they also have complex signal conditioning electronics. Third category is fiber optic sensors, and you will typically find fiber optic sensors in applications that are measuring pressure through a very fine or tortuous vasculature. Like, you know, these are typically used in FFR applications, right? Um, that are they're threading the the guide wire or fiber optic cable to a very fine portion of the vasculature. Um, this sensor uh, allows that allows that application, but also has some challenges. You know, it's it's very fragile. It's prone to breakage. Okay, and it's also um, susceptible to drift as the patient rolls over. You know, the fiber bends, what have you. You know, it might be measuring one pressure and yeah. and companies have evolved to mitigate that. But, you know, I just wanted to throw out the, the benefits and trade-offs of these sensor technologies when someone is starting this path of thinking about what, what it is that they want. Okay, so we've chosen the sensor. Now let's move on, right? You have to integrate that sensor, right? So sensor integration is very crucial, right? How we integrate the sensor plays a vital role in its performance characteristics, you know, especially drift, okay? Um, you know, this is where I'd like to say, you know, the men get separated from the boys, right? Um, it's one thing to have a sensor, but an entirely different thing to integrate it in a, such a way that you have good drift performance, good electrical isolation, it's rugged, and it can, you know, go through MRI and all that good stuff, right? Wiring, you know, uh, it might be very obvious, but you know, surprisingly, wiring is is a skill because now we're dealing with wires that are 49, 50 AWG, right? Extremely thin wires, about the diameter of human hair. There's not a lot of people who can actually manipulate wires on a high volume basis, you know, without yield losses. And then epoxies, uh, epoxies. You can get around epoxies when you're talking about integration, right? Um, these epoxies have to be bicompatible. Uh, you need to be able to make them over volume basis, you know, high volumes, you need to be able to control them such that there's no discoloration, no bubbles, so on and so forth. These are some of the typical challenges, you know, that someone's got to think about when they're going to integrate their sensor into their application. You know, usability is um, a very important area that, you know, I believe gets uh, very little attention, right? And I'll go through some examples of how usability plays a vital role, right? So now you got a sensor, you're building it into your catheter or some you know, implantable device or some form factor, right? We can have a great sensor and, you know, but if you can't zero the sensor, right? Uh, you're not gonna get good readings. 
ability to zero, the workflow is got to allow adequate zeroing abilities, right? If you want really accurate measurement, you got to make the, um, make, you have to make elements for proper zeroing. It could take five minutes, it could take 10 minutes. It can be critical in emergency applications where they don't have time, right? As soon as they open the sensor, it has to go inside the patient, right? So if you can, your work, you have to build your workflow around, in prop, around proper zeroing, right? I built my sensor into a catheter. Can it be placed accurately, right? The sensor might be, the designer might think the sensor is facing upwards, but when the physician delivers it, he likes to torque it. And so the sensor might be facing a different way, right? So the whole point over here is that the, these devices might not be used in the exact same way the designer intended to use them. They're getting used by people who are entirely different from the original set of people who designed them, right? Dislodgement. You might integrate your sensor if it's navigating a bend, right, in the vasculature. If it's going to do that in your heart and it's going to stay there for over three weeks, it's going to see a lot of heartbeats. Is there a risk from dislodgement? Can your, can your sensor pop out, right, if the physician doesn't place it, you know, the right way? Contact with tissue walls is an interesting thing. It can go both ways. There are applications that require contact with tissue walls, like RF ablation catheters, right? You want to make sure the catheter is touching the lumen, right, before you can start the energy, right? So you have these sensors that are sitting on the outside of the catheter, making sure that it's touching. Most cases, you don't want the sensor touching it the wall because you're trying to measure the pressure of a fluid, either the blood in the heart or, you know, intracranial pressure, what have you. So something to think about early on. If you're going implantable, then tissue growth is obviously a concern, right? You want to make sure your sensors are located in a place where there is not, there is high volume, high uh, blood velocity. You know, you don't want to keep it in a place where there's blood pooling and blood, uh, blood velocity is low. That's where tissue starts forming. And you also have to keep in mind if it's an implantable application, you know, you got to allow this uh, initial week or two before the tissue growth is stabilized and then the sensor is now ex exactly reading the right values, right? And finally, last but not the least, sensor integration allow for pushability, torqueability. We can have a sensor built into a catheter, but when the physician uses it, I can't push it, you know, I can't torque it, right? So all of that has to play into the method you're using to integrate the sensor. So this is why I think usability is very important. And a formative assessment, you know, early stages of product development can give a lot of indication of the challenges from usability. We've gone through the usability challenges. Okay, what are some of the safety challenges, right? Um, obviously, if your sensor is going to be blood contacting, you want to avoid sharp contours. Anywhere um, blood can pool and, you know, cause a risk of thrombosis. Um, you want to watch out for your electrical risk current, you know. Uh, most of the time, these sensors are using a DC up, uh, field, but if you're using AC excitation, there's capacitive transfer of current through the tissue and there's current transfer to the ground, to earth ground and there's standards around this, so you want to watch out for that. Reliability. Are my wires going to be affixed to the sensor over the life of the sensor, right? You know, it's going to see a lot of heartbeats, it's going to see a lot of stress. Um, the wires, the coatings that you apply over the sensor, is it going to last long? We talked about sensor dislodgement. Defib protection is a big thing. There's no way of getting around defib protection, right? Either you put in the IFU that the sensor can tolerate a defib without getting damaged, or you build your sensor to still operate in the presence of defib, right? And there's, there's, um, and these are decisions that need to be made early on. It's, there's going to have a cost factor to it. You know, the design's got to be more tolerant, the manufacturing is going to be more expensive and so on and so forth. So this is an important decision to consider. ESD tolerance is another one. ESD can hit you anytime, not just during manufacturing. Uh, many times the surgical rooms are not very controlled environments. Physicians are not wearing ESD straps on them. And the ESD can get delivered to the patient, not to the device. And the patient can deliver to the sensor, right? So you need to demonstrate that your device can tolerate, um, you know, sufficient levels of ESD. It doesn't have to be, you know, um, it doesn't have to operate even if it recovers within 10 seconds or if it recovers with the help of an operator, that's fine too. We just need to think about what strategy we're going to use in terms of ESD tolerance. Stray have high voltage fields. I just talked about uh, that surgical rooms or um, there's a bunch of equipment, there's no control over, you know, what equipment is throwing what kind of field on your patient. So it's very common for line voltages to appear on the sensor, um, although at low current levels, is your sensor going to tolerate that? 
performance um, is what everyone's after, right? But you know, the intent of the slide is to bring awareness to the fact that accuracy is actually a composite of several things, right? We talked about drift, right? Drift, is, sensor drift is something that is existing in all sensors, what kind of, in any technology, right? We can't we can wish away drift, we just have to manage it. So drift reduction is a function of zeroing, you know, it's a function of how you integrate it and how you use it. Um, operational altitudes is another important thing. You know, we talked about it earlier. It's one thing to get really high accurate operation in, in a limited range of pressures, applied pressures. But now if you're trying to use this over a wide range of altitudes, it's a completely different ball game. So that's something to be considered. Temperature range of operation. Um, you know, most of the times you're using the sensor between room temperature and body temperature. But, you know, can you afford the time that it takes for the sensor to make the transition? It's going to have a drift as it goes from room to body. You know, if it's emergency application, they typically can't afford that. And it might be certain applications you get exposed to intermittent heating, right? Is your sensor going to tolerate that? That's something to think about. Light sensitivity is a very important criterion. Uh, all these sensors are made from silicon. Silicon is uh, sensitive to light. Um, the light creates electron hole pairs that can cause, um, you know, temporary modulations in recorded signals. So if your application is going to have a light source right next to it, like, you know, the sen uh, if it's, it's got a camera and if it's got a light and if it's got a sensor, you want to make sure you protect the sensor from light. And there are some options available um, for those applications. But again, this is a criterion that you need to watch out for. Compliance to standards. There's no way of getting around standards. So, you know, you just have to embrace them. Um, I just wanted to, but this list is not comprehensive, but I just wanted to hit the main standards that govern, you know, integration of sensors and how to uh, manage risk. So uh, risk management, as many of you might be familiar, governed by 14971, talks about how to identify and manage risk at every stage, every phase of the product life cycle, you know, and um, this can be risks arising from, let's say, you know, uh, sharpness of the case. It can be risks arising from currents uh, from the sensor. It can be risk arising from uh, inadequate pressure measurement, right? So every stage we are required to mitigate those risks. Um, 60601 one talks about general safety, like risk currents and IP rating and stuff like that. Um, electromagnetic compliance, EMI and ESD are governed by a particular standard, dash one, dash two, that modifies the general standard. Here you're checking if your sensor is uh, compliant to RF energy, if it's immune to RF energy, or if it can tolerate ESD. And then there's other particular standards like um, that, uh, the blood pressure measurement standard, which is specific to the sensors, which is the AME BP22, and then the blood pressure measurement standard that measures your sensor along with your monitor as a system. It characterizes that, right? Intracranial pressure monitoring is a separate standard that um, governs the operation of sensors in that space, that is NS28. And then obviously we talked a bunch about usability in 62366 provides a very structured way of uh, identifying and mitigating usability risks. So we've started, chosen the sensor, gone through the usability safety challenges, we've identified the standards that we have to comply to, and now we are at a level where we can take it to production, right? Um, so it's one thing to make a few products, you know, uh, maybe a hundred here, two hundred there, but then it's a completely different ball game to be able to make these products consistently the same quality and at the same price point over the life of the product, you know, that requires expertise. Um, and I thought I'll highlight, you know, this over here, yield is directly impacts bottom line, right? Many of the Early stage companies, you know, typically don't realize is that the decisions that they're making upfront when it comes to production time, right? They might ask for the best accuracy possible, but then are they are we willing to um, afford the time, the test time that is required to demonstrate that your sensor is that accurate? Okay, so that begs the question: Is does my sensor have to be this accuracy? So accuracy directly transfers into bottom line. And then stuff like, can I think about using a UV cured epoxy? That'll save me a lot of lead time during curing. UV cured epoxies are good for applications where the light can penetrate and can cure quickly. And so it saves a lot of time during production, but might not be a good fit for applications where this you know, light can penetrate, right? 
during design, you want to think about making a design that passes, you know, OQ and PQ of the production. OQ, we are stretching the production to its limits. We're putting it at its limits and seeing the product that comes out of it, is it still meeting requirements, right? In PQ, we are trying to see if the design can be consistently manufactured over time, right? Now, it's it behooves the designer to make sure that the design is not one-off and it fits well within this OQ and PQ requirements. It saves a lot of cost, you know, down the stream. I mean, to think about all of these things up front. I think we hit some of these points earlier. Um, many of the regulatory bodies, whether it be the FDA or the MDR, want the same kind of things, right? They want you to demonstrate that uh, you've identified all the hazards, you have a plan to mitigate it, you have a risk management plan, right? Right from the time you started designing it to when you're manufacturing it, to even after product launch, you know, you have a plan that actually continually monitors the risks at each of these phases, and you're actually adequately responding to those risks that you identify. So a risk management plan is needed. And, you know, uh, part of the risk management plan could be your design of MEA if you're in the design phase, the process of MEA, the compliance tests that we talked about, and then design controls, right? Um, there's no way of getting around design controls. You want to uh, keep yourselves from shooting in the foot and making changes, you know, as you're progressing through the design. So there's reasons for putting controls to design. All right, let's summarize all we talked today. So we started with the usability challenges, and then we talked about safety challenges, then we went to performance. Um, we talked about compliance standards, compliance standards, the variety of standards. We talked about well, what are some typical yield considerations, and then we talked about regular submissions. As you can see, in you know, parallel to this, the quarters are ticking, right? And you don't want to have a four-year timeline. You know, this is where you, you know, traveling this path with a uh, with a partner who's got the experience can actually shrink this from four years to maybe two years. You know, it's not the same for all applications, but nevertheless, it behooves, us, behooves uh, uh, someone who's trying to integrate a pressure sensor to work with someone who's got the expertise who's been in this field for a long time. And that, you know, that's what we're trying to emphasize over here. So why Millar, right? Uh, Millar has been in, in the pressure measurement space for over 50 years. Okay, we are a high volume manufacturer. Um, we understand the space. We are in the, and we have all the expertise to manage the technical, the regulatory and production challenges that you know, we were talking about earlier, right? Um, we have a 25 year history with our largest OEM partner. Um, you know, Millards are called the gold standards. You know, if you go to Mayo Clinic, if you go to other clinics, right? They call our competition Millards. Okay, so that's, you know, it's kind of the gold standard by which every other pressure measurement device is measured. So, um, we have a proven track record of delivering low drift, highly accurate clinical products. Clinical, we're also in the uh, preclinical space. We work with a lot of universities um, in the preclinical space, provide specialty catheters and stuff like that. And then we are ISO 13485 certified. We have a um, clean room and we have established university partnerships and we have access to a large number of knowledge opinion leaders to assist with, uh, you know, any particular application space. So that brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, you know, one thing that I do want to emphasize is, and I presented a lot of information, but at Millar, this, um, more than a business, we consider this a mission, right? Our mission to enable other partners to measure pressure. And so if you're, um, if you've decided to travel this journey of pressure sensor integration, we're very happy to travel it with you, okay? To go along with you, whether it be a vendor or a customer, um, you know, and we consider that our mission. So with that, I uh, thank you for your attention and uh, we will be available at booth 2340. It's kind of kitty corner from here in that direction. So we'll be available for one-on-one -on -one discussions, what have you. And uh, if there's any questions, I'd be glad to take them at this point. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, so repeat the question. Um, so do you do all the different kinds of technologies, right, um, that I mentioned? We are predominantly in the piezo-resistive sensor space, okay? We have a lot of expertise with piezo-resistive sensor. 
but as a company millar is sensor agnostic and by that what we mean is we are willing to work we look at ourselves as a sensor integration company you know we don't we are not uh, sensor manufacturers so we are willing to work with any sensor that the customer wants to work with you know as a good fit for their application any other questions all right thank you gentlemen i'll be in booth 2340 if you have any questions we'll be glad to answer questions thank you